So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm, I, so this is work with Stephen Morris, an economist at Princeton. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to try my best. There's a bit of a, one thing that I like about this talk is that it, it's fundamentally about probability, not a, more, than, more than game theory, for example. But, but, so that's your home turf as well. But maybe some of the language, there, there can be a bit of a language barrier. So if, if I say something, if I keep saying something that's confusing, please just make me explain. I'm going to try to have examples, um, but I want to make sure that I that we don't get I don't I'm not unclear about any basic terminology. So um, let me give you a, a ma an informal but mathematical overview of what it is we're studying in this paper. Um, so suppose you have some random variable y. Think of it as a, a security price, something that's uncertain, and you have a bunch of different individuals who have, who have different uh, first order expectations about it given their private information. So these things might be different both because we learn different things about the world. Like we learned, you know, we care about the price of oil and we learned that um, the Iran deal is going to go through. But it, and maybe I know that before you, so I'll have a different expectation from you. But it might also be that even given the same information, we'd have different beliefs. And that, that, that's called a difference in priors. Uh, in any case, we have these private subjective beliefs. And um, someone might be curious about an average of that. So someone might be taking an opinion poll. And they might be curious about the average of individuals' subjective beliefs about this thing. And this someone, who we call J, you know, he, he doesn't know everything. So in fact, it, he'll be taking a subjective expectation of this average. So that's an object you can define. So this is a second order belief because it's, a, it's a, someone's subjective expectation of the average of a bunch of first order beliefs. And you can, you can keep doing this, right? Someone might care about the average of those things. And so you can compute some other, guy's K, some other guy K's average of these second order expectations. So that's the kind of beast that we, that we study. And I'm going to generalize, I'm going to, I def presented it this way, I'm going to generalize it in one kind of trivial way, which is that before these weights just depended on, you know, whose opinion it was we're averaging, but I can make the weights different depending on whether it's J who's doing this or, or K. So when J is thinking about other people's beliefs, he can average them in a different way than when K is thinking about them. So we have these gammas. And these gammas can be seen as a network of weights of how much guys care about each other. So um, we're going to study. So the talk is going to be about studying this object. And I'm going to, you know, in particular, as we do this for a long time. And I'm going to give you some reasons to care about it, but, but maybe not immediately. So, so uh, but if you get very impatient, ask me and I'll tell you. But I, we're going to do a little bit of math, and then I'll, I'll motivate it. Um, so. What are the kinds of results we're going to prove about these guys? So under a mild condition, which is basically a connectedness type condition, um, these iterated average expectations, as I keep doing this over and over again, they're going to converge to something we call a consensus expectation, which is basically just an expectation of whatever random variable we're talking about with respect to a certain measure called a consensus measure. So you can think of our main, the main thing that we bring you as this is this new object called a consensus measure. And what's interesting about it is that this consensus expectation is going to be independent both of um, who we ask. So if you look back here, we keep doing this. You know, it, it has to, if we do this literally infinitely, it's not well defined. So you have to stop at some point. Let's say when we stop, it's guy K on the outside, right? My claim is if I've done this for a long enough time, who's on the outside doesn't matter. This number is going to be the same no matter who's on the outside. And moreover, it's going to be uh, state independent. So it's actually going to be a deterministic thing that, w that these higher order uh, things converge to. Even though at every step, the expectation, the subjective expectation depends on people's private information. After we've done it for a long time, all that private information is going to wash out and it's going to be just a number. So a state and agent independent number. And the math of this, how this thing behaves, is going to come down to iterating Markov matrices. Uh, and so the sort of the trick, the, the um, Trick may be too much, maybe selling it too high. The, the idea that is just figuring out what the right Markov matrix is to write down so that you can capture this iteration in, a, in, in the correct way. That in, in, this will combine both the network structure, these gammas, with the information structure. 
And once you've done that, then figuring out all these, all these beliefs is going to be just about iterating a Markov matrix. So a conceptual punchline is that incomplete information and networks are in some sense the same thing, if you look at them the right way, at least in this kind of context. And so uh, a little sort of bigger picture, there are a bunch of papers, which I'll cite on the next slide, which think about, both in, in CS and economics, thinking about games played on networks. So people who take actions, thinking about what actions their network neighbors take. So that's a networks literature. In economics, probably less familiar here, is a literature on sort of higher order beliefs. So guys who are thinking about what other guys are thinking, about what some third guys are thinking, in order to decide what action to take in a game. So things like beauty contests. And so this higher order beliefs literature thinks about these things. And the punchline of these paper, this paper is that these two pictures are actually the same, that you can attach a network to this picture where in the math of analyzing that comes down to the same math as analyzing the network games that, that are, feel more hands-on, at least to me. So, uh, so what are we going to, so, so then let me tell you, that's the sort of conceptual framework, but what, do we, what can you do? Uh, we're, we, one thing we can do is unify a bunch of results from the past. So uh, one, one, way in which, one case in which people have studied this is with the common priors assumption. So suppose that we may have different information. So I'll give a concrete example in a minute, but suppose that, you know, where someone's going to draw a card from a deck and he's going to tell me something about it, like it's, it's suit, and he's going to tell you something else, um, like the number that appears on it. But if we have a common prior, so we believe it's being drawn fairly from the same deck, for example, um, then it turns out that that case has been, has, been under, has been well studied. And in that case, the consensus expectation is just the prior expectation of the random variable with respect to the common prior. Okay? So this is network independent. Even though these weights are all in there, whatever weights you take, as long as your network is connected, it, they're going to wash out, and you're just going to get the common prior expectation. So that's a case that we know. And in this case, the consensus measure is just the common prior. So another case that people have studied is one in which there's no private information. So individuals just believe something about, about the random variable, and everybody knows what everybody believes. But those things may be different. We may have heterogeneous priors. And in that case, the consensus expectation is a number which is a weighted average of people's heterogeneous beliefs weighted by their network centrality. So weighted by, by page rank, if you know, if you know what that is. So, so this, this is a net, people have studied this as a kind of a network coordination problem. And in that case, the right aggregator is network centrality. You, you take people's individual preferences or beliefs and you aggregate them according to their, their centrality weights. So what we do is we put these two things together and we're going to get some interesting mix of these two things. Um, we're going to find that a consensus expectation is still corresponding to taking an average, but now it's a more interesting average because I can't just say Scott, you know, I can't say average Scott's beliefs and Neil's beliefs in the following way because there are many types of Scott and Neil depending on what they learned, right? And so the whole question is how you average those, those uh, posterior beliefs. It's going to turn out to be not according to Scott and Neil's prior beliefs about themselves. Those don't matter. It'll be some interesting thing about the interaction of the network and other people's beliefs. And so characterizing that weighting scheme and, and giving intuition for it will be the main sort of, the, certainly the main thing in the talk. And we'll show how these prior results fall out. So, um, and, then, and then I've already begun advertising this. There are settings where these, I've given a quite nerdy introduction now so far, you know, just the mathematical properties of this thing, but there are cases where you care. So coordination games, where we're trying to figure out something to do, kind of hoping to do the same thing as others. Um, and then um, you can also give an asset pricing interpretation, where uh, if there's an asset that's frequently retraded, its price is going to be determined by basically this kind of beauty contest value, what I think you think, he thinks it is. And so we'll give, we'll give some, we'll do a little math, but then I'll show you how, how these applications boil down to the consensus expectation that I've, that I've showed you. So um, enough. So any, I'm going to start, I'm going to jump into to model, but I want to ask if there are any questions on big picture stuff. Yes. Um, as you commented yourself, I am unclear about the motivation. I mean, yes, I can take the second order of beliefs and third order of beliefs and stuff like that, but why? In fact, you actually showed me that it's kind of counterintuitive. If 
we all start with the common prior by doing that I get back to the common prior I don't get any more information about what actually happened yeah um, so I a big picture question is there are two kinds of worlds one in which there is meaningful information aggregation so that if you know you can think of a different of a different setting where for example I say what I think then you think about that for a while and then you say what you think and then I, you know, in view of what I revealed to you, and then, and then you say what your updated belief is, and then you tell me, and then I update. That's a, that's a quite different process, and in that case, there would be information aggregation. Uh, my claim is that there are economic settings in which, in which sort of the common, you can think of this as a bug or a feature. In some cases, when we have to coordinate, and we can't communicate while we coordinate, we just have to think, you know, we have to both sh meet somewhere on campus, and I think, well, where is he gonna try to go? But I know that, you're also thinking about that about me. And we can send each other messages. We have to just think really hard and both go to, the, to a place on campus and hope we you know, show up at the same place. In that case, I claim you know, these higher order beliefs really will come into your calculation. So I'll give you a more formal example. But I guess it seems to me hard to say a priori that this feature that this private information washes out is good or bad. It depends on what you care about. Yes, good. So if you're, I, I, if you're, if you're happy, about five minutes, and I'll, and I'll do the app because the notation will help in any case to do that. Okay. So, so let me tell you the basic notation of the model. We have a, we have, and I, I try, I'm going to try to copy the key stuff onto that board. Uh, sorry for those of you who have to turn around. So, um, there's a bunch of players. And there's two kinds of uncertainty. There's uncertainty about each other, what's going on in your head, and there's uncertainty over some, some stuff about the outside world, like how much oil is in the ground, okay? So it's, these are not always kept separate, but it's gonna be useful in this, in this setting to do that. So a type of, so I'll give a concrete example, but you should think of a type of an agent as capturing everything he knows and believes, including what he knows and believes about other people. And the external state is, the, the actual the thing that the random variable will at the end of the day depend on, which may be correlated with, with what people know and believe. But the overall, if I want to write down all the uncertainty, I write down this big, this big space, which is everything that's going on in people's heads, so this is the product of the type spaces, times the external realization. Okay. So that's the, that's the big, if in classical probability, this is the big omega, but I'm going to find it useful to, to kind of put a certain set of coordinates on it. Um, and players have different beliefs. These are priors. So these are beliefs over everything. You know, before the fact, we can ask them, what, are your, what do you think about everybody else, your, your, your type, other people's types, the state? So these, are, these pi i's are people's priors over everything. And as I've, we've already introduced these weights, but let me just repeat. So the weight gamma i j describes how much i cares about j. And this number will keep coming up. It's an I by I matrix, it's the network structure. And big, big notational convention that I'll always use is people are always in superscripts. So like gamma ij, I had both i and j in superscripts because they're people. And the subscripts will be indices of, of let's say, types here or, or which, what number state of the world occurred. So people are always in, in superscripts. Okay, so let me give a concrete example so that you can, you can, if you haven't run into these guys before, how you would map some little example into it. Um, suppose we have two people. I'm going to draw a playing card from some deck, and I'm going to tell agent one, where, uh, agent one whether it's black or red. Sorry, this black should be black. Um, and I'm going to tell agent two whether it's a face card, an ace, or something else. Okay, That's, a, um, that's a, something that you could imagine. So in, in a, our language that agent one will observe one of two signals, namely black or red, and agent two will observe one of three signals, which one of these it is. And so the type spaces are, type, the first type space is black and red, the second type space is face, ace, or something else. And theta, if you want, now maybe we're gonna bet, maybe each, each card has a dollar amount written on it, and we're gonna bet on how many dollars this thing is worth. So um, the external state is just everything, the card that was drawn. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's a, little, a little example, sort of just translating words into this notation. Any questions? Okay, um, so now let, let me 
define iterated average expectations in general. We're going to fix a random variable y on the state, state space. Um, and then I can define the first order average, the first order expectation is simply person i's expectation of y given his type, okay? Now, let me explain why there are two indices i here. Ti is the type, so for this guy it's whether it's black or red, so that of course matters. But another thing that matters is what he thinks about the deck, right? He might think that there are you know, more black cards or something, and then even conditional on his private information, he'll think different things. So this tells us what measure he's using in taking this conditional expectation. In probability, we often have just one grand measure, but here, unfortunately, we have to keep track of many just because there are many priors. Um, so these are first order expectations. Because this type is a random variable, this is a random variable. And it's, it, it's TI measurable. It's measurable with respect to I's private information. Okay? Given that you've defined this thing, you can define the second order average expectation as an average, according to person I, of these guys, right? Aver with weights depending on gamma ij, right? The weights are how much i cares about j. And so it's, a, it's an average. The average is taken across the population. And it's second order because it's an expectation of first order expectations. And then more generally, this is, this is the thing that we're going to, this is the main definition. So I'll copy it onto the board. Okay, so once I give you this, you can inductively build up this whole sequence of random variables. Okay, and what we are going to study is the limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, so to give a simple, to give a little example, suppose our network was you care about the guy in front of you clockwise, then the first order expectation, let's focus on guy number one. Guy one thinks something about it given his information. Guy two thinks something about that. Guy three thinks something about that, and then you can keep going. So these cyclic iterated expectations are a special case, that, just to be very concrete. Um, okay. So yes. So, so these might not have any like self loops in here. So my first order expectation may not have anything to do with my own belief. Yes. Now actually, there is no harm. <coughs> Certainly, the definition is coherent with loops, so so it's allowed. But for some of the game theory, it won't it it won't make sense. So we'll. We'll do both ways. OK. So, so let me tell you the result. So I'll do now two things. I'll state the convergence result. But, and then, and then, but before I prove it, I'm going to discuss those applications I promised you. So suppose that beliefs and the network are jointly connected. I'll tell you what that is later. Then for any random variable you bring me, um, the limit this limit of, of these higher order iterated expectations exists. It, as I told you before, doesn't depend on who's on the outside, who's doing the expectation last, and it doesn't depend on, on the state. It's just a number. And moreover, I'll even tell you what it is. It's a weighted average of stuff. It's a weighted average of, OK, so I'm summing both across individuals and then across type indices. and this consensus will be an average of various individuals' posterior beliefs for their various types, okay? So the things that are going into this average are definitely, you know, like to actually know what guy I thinks, I have to know what type he is. But ex ante, even before anything happens, I know that if Scott were to learn this information, if he were shown this card, he would think that. So I make a list of all those numbers before we ever see anything. And this tells me that if I average all those a priori known numbers in a certain way, according to certain weights, I, I'll get the consensus expectation that we'll all arrive at. So these, these PIKs are really weights. They add up to one if you, if you sum across everything. Um, and I'll tell you a lot about them. We, they're, they're not, there's a lot of structure in them. But we can already see something important. So they don't, for example, depend in any way on why, on what random variable we're talking about. All the information about that is in here. So there's a nice separation where the weights depend on the network and the higher order beliefs. And this stuff depends on the, the, the actual structure of the security that we're talking about. So there's a, it's a network weighted average of posterior beliefs. So there is actually some content in this statement. OK, except the statement is a lie. So what is true, I, for, for, for 
the usual reasons, for the usual Markov reasons, maybe this thing is actually a bit of a lie, maybe the limit doesn't exist. So I'm going to talk about a slightly different object, which is just a, a way, so this looks quite different. I claim it's more or less the same thing. What I'm doing here is I'm just taking a weighted average of these higher order beliefs for different n, okay? And I'm weighting them by r to the n, but r to the n is basically one. So, so I'm, taking, I'm taking the limit as r approaches one. So you should think of this as, I write down this whole sequence. I <coughs> weight each member of the sequence by r to the n for r very close to one. So it's basically a lot like a Cesaro sum. I'm just looking at along as, at, at, you know, what this thing looks like. This is basically a way of capturing what its tail looks like. And then this one minus r out here is just a normalization. So, so this is, so, so what is this doing? It's getting, in cases where the limit doesn't exist because they're cycling or something, this is saying, well, just average together what's happening, you know, over a really long string. Um, and that'll give you sort of the limit behavior. As I take r really big, it's putting weight infinitely far in the sequence, so it's, it's like a limit. So this is a more convenient thing to work with, and it turns out to be the right thing for the, for the game theoretic applications anyway, to which we now come. OK. So here's the simplest, kind of silliest game that I can write down to explain where this would come up. Suppose you have a guy who wants to set his, be his action. So we're all trying to decide what to do. Let's say um, we're um, fund managers and we're, we get punished if we, if we you know, look too different, but we can't talk to each other. It, you know, so someone's going to rate us. If you, look, if you choose a portfolio mix that's very different from others, you look weird, you're going to get punished, but you can't talk to each other because there's antitrust law. So you want to set your uh, action to a weighted average of what you think the thing is worth, but also a weighted average of what other people are estimating so that you don't look too, too off in either direction. So then the best, res just by assumption, I'm going to write down a best response map, a best response you know, function that says, that puts weight one minus r on your own subjective estimate plus a weight r on what you think other guys are doing, right, of their actions with weights gamma ij. Now, I've been sloppy here. I should actually put your, your subjective expectation of, of these actions, right? Because you don't know necessarily what they're doing. It depends on their private information. But you have this, you have this uh, best response function. And it turns out, so what can you do? How, wh what does this have to do with, with my iterated average expectations? Well, you can take this thing and keep plugging in. For AJ, you plug in this whole formula, right? So you, you keep replacing these actions with what those guys are doing according to the best response. And you're going to get now iterated subjective expectations. So a, a really simple result is that as you, as the weight on, as, as you mostly care about coordinating, as this coordination mode of R goes up to one, what you're going to be doing is this kind of limit, is, the, is exactly this limit of high order average expectations weighted by R to the N. Um, and so, so that is a, a micro foundation, right? So this is the setting, we get our private information once, we don't talk, we get, you know, we have payoffs that motivate us to do this, and we're gonna, and this is the prediction, this is what an analyst can say will be played in this game. Um, a, different, a different kind of setting, which boils down to the same equation, which may be, which some of you may like better, some may like worse, if you have, say we have I different populations, like different, uh, stock exchanges in different countries. And you have um, a continuum of each population, so all the agents are really small. And everyone in a given population has access to the same information. You know, they, they, all the TV and everything that's available in that country, they all, they all have access to it. They're risk neutral, they're, there's no discounting, and they're trading some asset Y. Now, suppose that someone is holding this asset at some moment, and there are two things that might happen. Maybe the world ends, the state is realized, and then you have to just, you, what you're going to receive is the realization of the asset. So, so in that world, you'll eat it. But if not, then with a certain subjective probability, um, you will have to sell it in some other exchange. So, so you're holding the asset, the, you have to sell it off, you can't hold on to it, and you're going to be selling it into a market, or maybe you can sell it to your own market, but you personally can't hold it, that's just assumed. So, and then you sell it into a market where you face population J. 
It's a competitive market, so what you can get paid for this thing is its value to that population. And it turns out that as, as, you, take, as you take this retrading thing up to one, as you make it basically compulsory to retrade, then again the valuation will converge to this sum of, you know, what do I, you know, how much can I sell it to Scott for, but when, he, when he's thinking about how much he can sell it to Neil for and so forth. And so these chains are gonna get propagated out. And again, it's gonna be a consensus expectation that determines the price. So these are the sort of beauty contest rationales in which, um, in which, in which these uh, numbers end up being important. So I have a question now. Is, are you, I don't know your name, but are you happy? Um, seldom. <laughs> <laughs> So they're also, so I should say, now the last thing I'll say that before getting into sort of the, the proof and stuff is that these applications are the easiest to say, but actually in some sense not the most important from our perspective. So we, um, there are a bunch of situations in game theory, like the analysis of robustness of equilibria, where people do quite delicate, delicate arguments relying on, the common, on a common prior. So, I mean, my co-author Stephen Morris is, is a, has written a lot about this, but other people as well. And uh, basically, you can use cases with a common prior to prove certain subtle things about people's higher order beliefs, which show that, um, for example, an equilibrium is robust even when people may not be perceiving the game exactly correctly. So there's some misperception, but we can nevertheless prove that everybody's willing to play an equilibrium. And those arguments rely on certain subtle constructions that are always done in the presence of the common prior. A th an application which is much more interesting and subtle than this one is it turns out that in those arguments you can replace the common prior if it doesn't exist you can replace it with this consensus expectation and run the same proofs so we can construct for example robust equilibria even in cases without a common prior so really the main the our main you know we motivate these are little toy stories you can tell to give yourself some intuition for these guys but the real value I think of the consensus measure is that it, it's sort of a poor man's common prior that behaves mathematically enough like it that you can run the old arguments and so and that expands a whole bunch of results into new territory so that's that's why if you want to know the secret reason why, why we really care that's why but I'll you know these these examples give you some that's not good ah These examples give you some, some intuition for what these things are, at least in a simple case. So, so now let me, tell you, let me tell you some math. How do we prove that these guys converge? What we're going to do is we're going to introduce some linear operators so that we can conveniently describe the inductive definition of iterated expectations. And it, a key operator will turn out to be a Markov matrix. Now everybody knows about how Markov matrices behave under iteration. So, um, we're, we're going to be able to use that to prove our result, but we're also going to be able to use it to think about high order beliefs, which I find personally a little intimidating. We're going to be able to, to think about them using our usual intuitions about random walks, which, which are more hands-on, more physical in some sense. So that's, that's the big overview of the proof. Um, so how, now in more detail. So <coughs> remember this key definition that the n plus one iterated expectation is, is this thing weighted average of the previous steps expectation, previous steps x's. So let's, let's introduce some linear algebra friends to keep track of this stuff. So let vi be the, the vector space of all the random variables that are measurable with respect to i's information. Okay. So a typical element tells me, you know, because i's information is just his type, it tells me what every type of agent i will, will think about that thing. That captures everything about a random variable from i's perspective. Um, now, if I want to think about i's conditional expectation of a tj measurable random variable, so I'm thinking about Scott, Scott's information is described by a vector like this that has as many entries as Scott has types. And I, we were trying to figure out what I think about Scott. Well, that's going to be a linear map that takes his random variables to my random variables, right? So, um, and why do I know, we'll talk more about what this map is, but I know it's linear because it's just a conditional expectation, right? So sums of random variables should, it should commute with all the usual things. Uh, now, 
Another thing I could do, so now we have all this, we have this vector space to keep track of my random variables, Scott's random variables, Neil's random variables, and so forth. We can paste them all together, so we have this big vector space which has all the random variables in it. And, um, and then I can define the average expectation operator as just the operator which, which you know, takes average, takes these linear maps which take my expectations about the individuals and averages them together with the weights. So this is, non this is just notation. But now I've, I've translated it into, into the language of linear operators. So let's do a little, um, and so we paste these together, we get a big map which takes a whole list of people's expectations at step n to a whole list of people's expectations at step n plus one. Um, any questions about notation? So let me a little more a little more hands on. Let's go back to our um, to our card example. This should be black. Um, so we're going to tell agent one whether we drew a black card or a red card. Agent two whether it's a face card, an ace, or something else. And let's say now I haven't defined I haven't defined the security price. I haven't defined what it is, you know, these are cards for now, but let's suppose we write a number, as I said before, on each card describing what that's worth, and what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how much is this thing worth, or more precisely, what I think you think it's worth, and so forth. So, since guy one observes only, only two signals, potentially, we have a belief that he would have if it's red, and a belief that he would have if it's black. And guy two, he observes three things, so he has three different types. Um, and now these updating matrices, they look like, so, so the question is, if, if let's say the, so I'll make Neil my, my black red guy, N Neil has, or sorry, no, I'll make Neil guy two. So Neil knows whether it's a face card, an ace, or other. I only know whether it's black or red. So if I knew, you know, I have my own information, and then I have to figure out what do I think Neil thinks about this thing? Well, a way that I should do that is I should average together the, the potential beliefs that Neil has for every type he might be, weighted by how likely I think he is that type, given what I know, right? So this is, for example, this is my belief, so let's just do it, do it in the context of the example. If, so my first row corresponds to I've observed a black card, and the probability conditional on my observing a black card that it's a face card is six out of 26, because there are six face cards out of 26 black cards. And I will then multiply that by what Neil thinks the card is worth, conditional on being a face card, okay? So, and then, so that will give me, so if I apply this matrix B12 to a vector of Neil's beliefs, so this two by three matrix times the vector of Neil's beliefs, this is his beliefs conditional on it being face. This is his belief about the value conditional on it being an ace. And this is his belief conditional on it being other. If I multiply it by that matrix, I get my belief about his belief of the value, okay? So that's how these matrices work. And, and I can do it, I can define the analogous matrix for him. For each of the three things he observes, he has a belief about, about my estimate of the value. And so by applying these guys, so the name of the game is you, you take one of our beliefs, you hit it with my matrix, then you get my beliefs, then you hit it with his matrix again, and that's how you do this, this iteration. And I should say that here I've worked, I've made the numbers the obvious ones if we're drawing from a standard 52 card deck fairly. But maybe, I think, maybe Neil is offering me this game and he's, and I think he's cheated, but he knows he hasn't cheated. So in fact, in my matrix, I may have different numbers here corresponding to my, to my prior belief that he's removed a black ace, right? But he knows he hasn't done it, so his matrix actually looks like it's supposed to look. And, and so that's also feasible. That's something that we can do in my framework, uh, which, which the standard common prior analysis doesn't, doesn't permit. Any questions about this example? Okay, so, so remember there are two key steps. So the one key step is this iteration where we 
where we take the step n expectations and compute from them the step n plus 1 expectations. But another step is coming up with the initial beliefs about the first order beliefs are, are different from this. because So how do we do that? We've already, so this B, B matrix that I've shown you has captured two. How about one? Well, it's, it's basically the same, right? If we define a vector space um, to be the space of, so sorry, this should say, this is wrong. This should say the vector space of random variables measurable with respect to the true state of the world, the state space, the state theta. Um, I can have a vector space capturing that. A typical element is just what the, um, yeah, so just ignore, ignore this, ignore everything up, up here. The main point is I can define a linear map from the set of state measurable random variables to Ben measurable random variables describing what I think about this given my information. And if we paste all these together, we can get for any security price that depends on how much oil in the ground there is, we can get a list of our first order conditional expectations given our type. So that's get, that gets this process going. Then if we, if we have that operator, we can compute these first order conditional expectations. And then we can, get our, we can start, our, start the iteration and, and start computing these XIs. Okay. Sorry about the typos. Okay, so, so, what we're, so in the end, at the end of the day, what we end up studying is B to the N. So B is this matrix that captures the iteration. And, and, the first, and the first step of taking first order beliefs is captured by this F object. So what we care about in the end is studying B to the N FY, where Y is some security price that, that depends on the state of the world. And so um, if, we, if I now show you the convergence result again, what I claimed is that, is that this guy converges to something, right? This guy, this C, this limit as R goes up to one uh, exists and has all these properties. You'll, you'll now see that it boils down to some stuff about Markov matrices. So, um, so here's how this works. So B will turn out to be a Markov matrix. And so this is like the very broad overview. It turns out that once we've translated this iteration to matrix notation, the key matrix is a Markov matrix. And so actually what we care about is showing that this limit, you know, as R goes up to one, this limit exists and is constant. But what is this? This is basically the long run distribution of the Markov chain, right? It's, you can think of this, this thing is exactly like taking a Markov chain with transition matrix B and stopping it at every step with probability uh, one minus R. Right? And so if as R goes up to one, then the chain will run for a really long time. And I'm asking, well, where do you expect it to be when it stops? Or what do you expect the security price of the, val of the node that it's had to be when it stops? Well, it's going to be essentially the stationary distribution. So the reason that this thing has this nice limit is because we're asking essentially about the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. So actually, generically, I didn't have to do all this goofy stuff. I could have just talked about the di directly talked about this limit. That would have, you know, unless you have per periodicity type problems, that thing also exists. Um, you know, it turns out that we care about both, and so we have results about both. But now let me tell you, there was an assumption in here in this result that you need some connectedness, as you usually do with Markov chain convergence, right? So what does connectedness mean in this context? I will tell you. So uh, let me show you the key, the, the graph that this Markov process is happening on. It's a graph that looks like this. We make, there's a big group of nodes for every person. So this is the Ben group of nodes, this is the Neil group of nodes. And inside each group, there's a node for each type, for each private information set I might have. And the edge from a given node in one group to a node in another group has a weight that's equal to what? Well, it's equal to how, how much does this, this person care about that person, that's gamma ij, times the subjective belief that this type has. <laughs> to depart the talk as soon as possible. That's <laughs> um, so 
this is a product, this is the caring part, and this is the probability part, how likely this guy, this type of I thinks that type of J is. So you build this graph, and it turns out the Markov process that we care about is going to be this, the Markov process that I've described to you, that if you interpret these arrows as transition probabilities, and then the connectedness assumption is just that this graph is connected, okay? Right, that you can get from any type to any other type by following some arrows with positive weights. Um, this is a joint condition on both the network and people's beliefs. So you can, if you think about it for a while, you can see that um, you can you can see that, for example, the network can be connected. The gammas can all be positive even, but it may still be that this graph is disconnected. Um, yes. So was yes, that's right. That's right. Because I can't. I, I know what type I am. If you want, if if you, yeah. So that's a bit of a technical artifact of this construction, but you have no interior arrows. Yeah. In the initial example where I, like, one only cares about two, two only cares about three, three only cares about one, mm -hmm. is that a such case where? So you can put a further assumption. So I mean, yeah, if you, if you. The, the, this would not be connected, right? It depends. OK, so let's suppose that it's complete information. So every agent only has one type. Then it is connected because it's a triangle. No, no, no. I mean, there are several types of the yeah, so, so now a way for it not to be connected, let's suppose that it can be, you know, let's suppose that it can be rainy or sunny, and whichever one of these it is, so there's a rainy type and a sunny type of each agent. But when it's raining, I know that you can also see that it's raining. And so when it, the rainy type of me plus places probability one on the rainy type of you, right? So then in that case, the picture we would have would be, there would be an outside triangle and inside triangle. So these are the people. And the inside type, the types on the inside are the sunny types. The types on the outside are the rainy types. And you can see that this is, this is not a connected graph, right? It's, it, it, it's two separate triangles. That corresponds to the fact that if it's common knowledge that it's raining, then we're going to have beliefs about the security price for the rainy day. Right? And we all know that we all believe that, so no matter how many times you go around. So, so the irreducibility includes this assumption that essentially none of us are all sure that everybody else is, it's not the case that we're all sure that everybody else is sure, blah, blah, blah. And, and but that should have like a stationary distribution for each complex. Yeah, exactly. So in some sense, it's not a sub, it, this is essentially boiling down to the smallest irreducible. Did you have a? No, I like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, so the realizations are, are these nodes. Right. So, so when you say for any realization you have an irreducible mark, what is the, does that mean? Because this is a non-random object. Once I tell you, like once I tell you the structure, this captures all the randomness in some sense. It captures all the beliefs and everything, all the conditional beliefs. So, if I if I try to think about what it means to say conditional on this this node, it's an irreducible. What does that mean? It, it, but it does, it, to think of it from the perspective of a node, it means from any node you can get eventually, you know, you believe someone is possible, so you have positive weight on someone who thinks, who has positive weight on someone who... So if I do that as the condition probability, does that give me a Markov Exactly, so that's it. And it's just, just as that Markov chain is irreducible. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, which I could answer better if I if I honestly knew what belief propagation is. I I very I very vaguely know, but not well enough to give. It, at some level, I I think it is very similar to to that kind of procedure in the mechanics. And actually, our we view our contribution not as analyzing. Once you boil it down to this process, I would say we're done. 
Um, it's pointing out that certain things about coordination games that economists have cared about are actually literally the same thing as this kind of belief propagation Markov process. And so, so we, now we will have economic applications that require more work, but once this reduction is done, there's no new math, for example. Um, so, right, so I told you before that we're going to be interested in this high order iteration of the first order belief. <coughs> and um, I've already illustrated this in an example, you know, what the entries of these matrices look like. They're different guys' conditional beliefs about other guys. So here I'm saying that formally, I'm saying that in this, line, in this matrix that captures how I updates about, how I takes conditional expectation of J's beliefs, the KL entry is gonna just be the conditional probability that guy I puts given this type, given type K, on guy J being of type L. And so we, so the, that's kind of meaningless symbols, so the, the way to, it's, it's just this. And the only thing I wanted to point out to you is that I hope 6, 2, and 18 add up to 26, okay? So the problem, the, if you think about my beliefs, you know, Neil might be one of his many types, but you know, but the subjective probabilities I assign had better add up to one. So each of these Bij's is a Markov matrix. As I think about Neil's types, it's a Markovian thing. And um, if you look at how we, so, so each of these matrix, matrices B is a Markov matrix. And now if you think about this, this big matrix B, so now remember I told you I would define a matrix that does the aggregation, that does the averaging. So if you stare at it for a while, you'll, you'll realize that what this big matrix B that takes as input are everybody's beliefs and spits out everybody's beliefs. Well, it's going to be this block matrix, which puts, which has weight gamma one one on, so this is guy, when guy one is thinking about, so sorry, ignore this, this is actually, I mean, this is correct, but it won't matter. Let's say the first guy is thinking about the last guy, he's using this weight, and then using his updating matrix. So what we end up getting is this big block matrix that consists of whose pieces are stochastic matrices and these weights in every row also add up to one. So you can see that what you get after you do all this is still a stochastic matrix, right? Because each row of each of these pieces adds up to, to one and then we're taking an, uh, a weighted sum of them with weights that add up to one. So the row, each row of the big thing will also add up to one. So this is the big matrix B that we care about, and it just corresponds to that picture that I, that I showed you um, of, the, of the Markov process. So, so this, is the, this, is the main, this is the main object we study, and now let me tell you, I mean, now you can of course see the, so first of all, the proof is more or less done, right? Because once, if you believe my claim, that, th that that iteration, the Xn iteration, boils down to just applying B over and over again, then all I have to, all you have to know about it is it's an irreducible Markov matrix and it has all these nice limits. Question? Where are creeping? I mean, if it's just a Markov matrix, uh, it has a station solution. But it may be periodic, right? So, oh, okay. so if I want to just think about the limit of B to the N applied to some X, it might jump around. If I do this averaging the tails, then it won't, that, that'll settle down. Um, so, because this B is a Markov matrix, I know what its limit looks like. Its limit looks like, you know, the limit of B to the N with high power N applied to X looks like, oh, I can write it like this, where P is a row vector um, with the property that P times B equals P, so the stationary distribution, right? <coughs> if I, if I want to know what the expected value of some random variable is after a long time that the Markov chain is running, then all I have to do is take the expectation of that random variable under the ergodic distribution. And um, this P is an ergodic distribution on the, on the state space that I showed you in the picture, namely the union of all the individual type spaces. So this basically proves the theorem that at least when it exists, so this is the, the easier version of the theorem, when this limit exists, it's equal to the ergodic, it's equal to a weighted, a weighted sum of these 
values where the values are, that are attached to the nodes are just their first order beliefs. So it's a little high level in the sense that, you know, I think belaboring, belaboring the details of this won't be that enlightening, um, but you could easily do it yourself. But I do wanna, so any, any high level questions about how this argument works? Um, let me tell you, the last thing I wanna say is, is some of the, in, I, at some level, I, so this relates somewhat to the last question is like, is this just belief propagation and what is new here? Um, there's some, once you have this characterization that the consensus expectation is a weighted <coughs> average of types, beliefs, then you can ask, well, what are the features of this weighted average? And it turns out that the weights have some nice properties which are completely trivial to observe once you have this characterization, but which are economically interesting. So let me, let me show you what these, weights, what these weights tell you, and we'll do that by quickly exploring some special cases. So just for, um, I'll take about another 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes to talk, and then after that, I'm happy to take questions or go offline with questions. Is that a usual use of time? Okay. So. Let's imagine that there's no incomplete information. This is, I'll, I know we can tell you about a whole bunch of papers quickly. If there's no incomplete information, then the types are singletons. So each individual has only one type. And so this big graph that I showed you is just a graph where nodes are individuals and the links between them are how much individual I cares about individual J. In that case, this P is just a left-hand eigenvector of the gamma matrix of the network um, and it's, it's, you can think of it as the page rank of the network of describing who cares about whom. So in that case, we can write the consensus expectation as a weighted average of just individuals heterogeneous expectations. There's no conditioning here because there's no private information weighted by their page ranks. So this is the complete information case that, that, that is, you know, well known. Now, it turns out that this is a special case of something much more interesting which is that if you take all the weights of a, uh, that correspond, suppose now there is incomplete information. So there's 16 types of me and 22 types of Neil. One thing you could still do is you could forget about all that for a second and just still think about the network of weights, the gammas, who cares about whom. And you could let Q hat in general be the left-hand eigenvector of gamma with eigenvalue one, which is the page rank, which the eigenvector centrality, right? Um, so it satisfies this condition that my centrality is the weighted sum of other people's centralities weighted by how much they care about me. Now another thing I could do separately, so forget about that for a second. Separately, I could just take all the weights attached to my types and add them up. So I have 17 types, each of them has some weight in determining the consensus, add all those weights up. Do the same for Neil. It turns out that the, that the weight of all my types taken together will be exactly equal to my eigenvector centrality in the, in the network if I hadn't kept track of any of the incomplete information, right? So a player's, the weight of a player's types add up to network centrality. And so, so this is a, it, it's, it's completely obvious from the structure of the Markov chain. This result is, is a good exercise that takes a minute to, to prove, but um, it has a sort of, in my view, kind of deep meaning that that the, these, network, these network games that people were studying actually generalize very naturally to incomplete information where you just take the influence that was accorded to, some, to each agent and split it up in some way, a little bit of influence for each of its types. So we can actually, you know, to, to keep track of that, you can write the weight of type K of, age, of agent I as his network centrality times what share of his centrality this type gets. So it's almost like a probability. I mean, it, it be, it's like a probability of that type, except is it, is it a probability? What is it? So um, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment, um, but I wanna say, you know, I wanna highlight this again. And, and actually the way you prove this result is you just imagine, you think about your Markov chain, but you coarsen it and you forget about in which of these, blue, you forget exactly where in a blue circle the, the particle is. It's, then you get a Markov chain with transition probabilities gamma ij, and the stationary distribution of that thing has to be, you know, has to correspond nicely to the stationary distribution of the real thing. And so that's, that's how you prove it. Um, now, it turns out that these R's really are probabilities in the sense that if you had common priors over types, so we all have, a, we all have our beliefs about each other's types are all consistent with a common prior. So for, in, for example, we believe that we're drawing from the same fair deck. 
In that case, this type weight that each of Neil's types gets is just the prior probability of that type of Neil. Okay, so that's that's a, a dummy check that this is delivering something sensible. Um, and in, in fact, we can prove using this fact, it's not, a, it's not completely obvious, but using this fact, we can even establish that um, the consensus expectation in the common priors case will just be equal to a weighted average of, of individuals' prior expectations weighted by their network centralities. Okay, so that's a consequence of this decomposition that you have to do a few lines of algebra to, to discover. So the big picture point is that once you have this Markovian way of viewing things, you can immediately start showing a lot of things about what consensus expectations look like um, that, both that both recover prior results but also give us you know, different intuition like this network centrality splitting into type centralities. Um, and so as I, as I told you, I promised you before that if there are common priors, this consensus expectation is just equal to the prior expectation. Now that you see this result, that's obvious, right? Because if we all have the same measure, then all these, all these I-labeled expectations are just the same expectation operator, and we're averaging it, but it doesn't matter what, how we're averaging it, we're just gonna get the prior expectation. And I've already told you that when we have no private information, we get common priors. Well, in that case, this formula holds, but in that case, you can think of it as a common priors case because there's only one type of each agent, so there's nothing to have interesting beliefs over. Okay, so, um, so the rest of the paper, so I'll, 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 now, I'll now wrap up. I'll, I sh I'll advertise what we do in the rest of the paper, and then I'm happy to talk to people about, about um, you know, our main, our main new results are about characterizing what happens when you have neither common priors nor complete information. Consensus expectations will still exist, consensus measures will still be well defined, but now they can't be written as in any, there's not too, too much to say about them in general. In particular, these probabilities that each type of a guy gets will now be interesting and will depend on what everybody believes about everything, kind of, right? So, so I can't say anymore, oh, it'll just be the prior probability of that type of Neil because there is no prior probability. Like, it sort of is what it is. You can use it like you use a prior, as I said, and um, we're also curious about, you know, what do these, since these matter for the outcome, we can ask, what are these weights gonna be equal to? Um, and we show, for example, that even though you have the same network of who cares about whom, you can get very different coordinations depending on beliefs in, that can't happen. So in the common priors case, nothing like that can happen. But once you move away from common priors, beliefs start mattering in a new and interesting way. Um, and, and we have a, a sort of application that shows that when you have, um, under, in a certain set of environments, which I, won't, which I won't define for you, but it turns out that in a certain sense, it's the less informed individuals whose prior beliefs are gonna make a big difference. So there's a, a fairly general way of saying that, that if you consider, if you, if you think about some people being very informed, having very precise but imperfect information, and other people being ignorant, um, at least relatively, even if they're pretty well informed too, but they're much more ignorant than the informed guys, it's gonna be the ignorant guys whose information is gonna matter for the coordination, which goes back to this counterintuitive feature that in these beauty contests, they're actually bad at aggregating information. What they do is they pick up the sort of, they, they, they lead to this diffuse situation where we coordinate on a, a ex ante thing. And the, the one of us, so to get, this is the last result I'll mention, so I'll just describe it intuitively. Suppose that, um, you know a lot about the Harvard campus, but I'm a visitor, and we have to go to the same place. We don't know where we're supposed to meet, but we, we have to pick a time and a place to coordinate, right? So you might know, like, you might know that both of us are starting out from, you know, I'm starting out from Litauer, and you're starting out from Maxwell Dwork, and so it makes perfect sense to meet in the, in the middle of the law school courtyard. That's fairly focal. But unfortunately, I'm a tourist, so I don't even, I don't really know where Maxwell Dworkin is. So you know that I'll go to the John Harvard statue, right? Because that's sort of, and, and, and I know that you know that about me, so I'll go there. So it's, it's the beliefs of the less informed guy that'll end up determining the coordination. And we have a set of formal results that flesh out that intuition. Okay, so, um, so I will, um, I'll wrap up there with the official part of the talk and just conclude by saying that these consensus expectations exist quite generally. They have uh, economically interesting properties and applications of which I've mentioned only a few. And I think, Jason Hardline has been encouraging me to make this the pitch, so I'll make, this will be my, my um, 
first try of the pitch, that higher order beliefs just seem obviously absurd, especially to non-economists. Like, who really cares what I think about what you think what I think? Not only, I mean, first of all, there's a, a, a real question of whether it's economically realistic to think about those things, but then there's another question of could players ever compute these things, or should we just throw out this idea for computational reasons? This says that, at least in our setting, the, the math of this is no more complicated than iterating Markov matrices, which, uh, you know, it's, that's not a computationally difficult problem. It's a question of, there is a question of whether it's behaviorally realistic, but there's at least no computational obstacle in our setting. So, and it, and it does give a new set of, of mathematical techniques and intuitions from random walks and other things that you can use um, if, you, if you run into these problems. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Yes. I have a question uh, about uh, an epistemic logic, which you can think of as a discrete setting about reasoning about knowledge and beliefs. Uh, there's a very big difference between I knowing that J knows that K knows, and so on, uh, with you know, undoubted chains, versus having a common knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is what's going to happen in the fifth one. But it seems you don't need that distinction. It's not that every player needs to know in advance that everybody knows what the fifth one is going to be in behavior. Do you have an intuition for why so good question. the movement of streets to continuous, you know, to, to quantifying beliefs changes? Yeah. Um, I think I understand your question mostly. So the irreducibility assumption, in part, one way of reading it is that there is no, there is no non-trivial subset of states that's common knowledge. That's basically. So we can't, it can't be common knowledge that it's sunny or it's rainy. At least we've restricted to the set of states where, where there's no common knowledge left. And so now the, the key idea, and this, this result is not, uh, you know, this observation has been made many times, but Shin and Williamson, for example, have a paper that says, as long as you don't have, as long as you don't have common knowledge, then high order iterated expectations are common knowledge. That is for every, st there is a common knowledge limit to which all high order iterated expectations will converge. Okay, so it's not a trivial, this SAM at 98 result is maybe the clearest statement of it. It says that, that as long as there's, there's not perfect common knowledge at the first order, the limits will converge to some common knowledge thing, which in fact is the prior under common priors. And, and so it's related to this fact that the prior is in some sense common knowledge in these models. So, so this, but it is, I mean, this is literature, maybe a high level answer is it is deeply connected to those things. And there are subtle facts about limits that correspond to you know, the, the epistemic logic of common knowledge. Yeah? Um, sort of following up on that, but is it also that maybe there's a difference between just defining, okay, what is this sort of limit, and it's sort of an analog of common knowledge, versus if we have a game and we want to talk about equilibria, like a base Nash equilibrium, and so is it, you know, there, like, we require, you know, the common knowledge of the payout structure and the prior and things. So is it tricky to define an equilibrium if we, we have these subjective beliefs. Good, okay, so, so, we, so we are working, like when I showed you the little coordination game, I did implicitly use Bayes-Nash equilibrium, and I assumed that each agent is optimizing given his subjective beliefs. Now one thing is that, you know, that's easy to define formally from an, an, an like if I know his beliefs, I can say, okay, he maximizes this given his beliefs. But the usual perspective we take in economics is that you don't know anything as the analyst. You observe behavior and you can elicit, you know, beliefs. So, so one question that's related to the question you're asking is, can you give, there are epistemic characterizations of equilibrium, like, uh, like Brandenburger, Alman, Alman Brandenburger, who characterize correlated equilibrium in epistemic terms. And a question that's interesting is, when you have non-common priors, is there any, any non-trivial characterization of equilibrium? And the answer is, we don't know, maybe not. So that's not such a good, that's not so good for me. Um, I, you, so equilibrium, let's say that equilibrium still makes, ma mathematically makes sense if I could imagine eliciting the agent's beliefs over all the types and so forth. But these types are a fiction that the analyst introduces. So there's something a little funny about asking your, asking your agents about fictions. And so I, so you raise a good point that the foundations of this equilibrium notion require more thought. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the theory is so suppose that you know, one of these huge P matrices you know, change some entry by epsilon. So if you don't 
know exactly my belief about how you would update your belief mm -hmm. with respect to some information. So can that like change the, the entire limit? A great question. So that's a, that's a super good question. So it, one of the virtues of this is that you can boil down your question to just a question about Markov chain. So you're really asking about you know, how stable are Markov chain stationary distributions to perturbations of entries, um, right? That because the, the big B matrix stores people's conditional beliefs. And so, and now the, that is a rich question. Um, the, the quick answer is that if you perturb something, if, you, if your chain is nice and connected and you perturb something that's not taking it much closer to disconnected, then you're fine. And then, then, you know, eigenvectors are continuous in that part of the world, but if your chain was almost irreducible and you start screwing with the part, sorry, almost reducible and you start screwing with those links that were keeping it connected, then you can make big swings with only small changes. So this actually illuminates which, you know, which misperceptions or imprecisions will lead to big changes in the aggregate behavior. Probably stop. So one last point I'd like to make is about PP. So PP is not even uh, sure to converge on graphs that have cycles. That's right. Whereas here, you, know, you showed convergence independent of cycles. So well, I showed I, I, I did it by cheating. I did it by yeah. changing what I mean by convergence. Yeah. 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 Sure. So so if you did have cycles, you know, it's not a horrible mess, but it's, we just wanted to keep it clean. So, yeah. so, so it's linear, right? Maybe it's you sometimes allow yeah. uh, other. Right? Yeah. Yes. Just trying also to connect your results with um, uh, the notion of Russian expectation equilibrium in financial economics. Mm -hmm. So in your case, if you have the, the conditional uh, beliefs at full support and that everybody's trading with everyone, so you have your condition is satisfied, so you would this would provide a foundation for the rational expectation equilibrium when you have private information, or it would everybody has some private information, but the price converged to the uh, in a way that your private information doesn't matter any, any like the price aggregates everything. Is that is, so there, is there a connection to there, yeah. <laughs> trying to? Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, and I know that the fund, you know, there's there are criticism of this, this notion of rational expectation equilibrium, but. You know, some ways you could, what you, your results could provide some foundation. Yeah, um, it's, okay, so this goes back a little bit to this other question. We, in financial markets, it's often the case that trading reveals so something about private yeah. information. We, if you remember the financial model here, we assumed, There's no trade. I, it, it's, we, because all agents are infinite, so you're holding the security, but you're, everybody's infinitesimal, and they sell the security into a market where the price depends on what they think it's worth, not what not what you think it's worth. So somehow, this, by making everybody really small and introducing a particular protocol of trade, we've turned off information aggregation. In the you, so a typical result that one hopes for in a financial model is that the is that the security price aggregates in some magic way all the private yeah. information, and that can happen if I move the price, then you look at it, you say, why did that happen? Oh, now in combination with my information, I know that yeah. whatever, and then. Here, it's a no information aggregation uh, result. So it, it's, um, it shares the quality with rational expectations that everybody is thinking very clearly about what other people are gonna be willing to mm -hmm. pay for it and so forth. But it differs in that there's no aggregation kind of by construction. So, so another way, you can think of these, you start out with some state of information and you can think of it getting more and more refined and information getting aggregated. That's the kind of the canonical model. In our world, information actually gets kind of diffuse. You go, go away, you go toward the ignorance limit where, you know, which is the common prior, for example. In the, so, so it's sort of a, compl a complement or a contrast, I would say, to the standard financial model. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you.